This episode includes some details of a graphic nature. Please take care while listening. A six-year-old boy stands in front of an open coffin. His mouth is curled down slightly, and his eyes are lost behind large glasses. His right arm is pushed up and draped over the side. The boy is wearing a baggy white t-shirt with a photo of his dad, who is posed resting his hand on his chin. Dad is wearing a top with a picture of father and son together. A large arrangement of sunflowers, pink carnations, and red roses covers the lower half of the coffin. And the left side and back of Dad's head have been restored to mask the massive trauma caused by a close-range shotgun blast. Jacksonville, 911, McKenzie. Yeah, there's somebody been shot down at the boat dock. The boat dock from your address? From my address, it's about five houses. To the right or to the left as you're looking at your house from the street? To the right. Who shot? Is this a white male or a black male that's been shot? I don't know. I just pulled in from work, and then somebody just pulled, come running up here, yelling at us, telling us somebody laying in a puddle of blood. Okay. But they think he's been shot? That or he's been stabbed. Can you show the officer where the dock is if he comes to your address? Yes. 911, Brown. Yes, this is Officer Deuce from Jacksonville Beach. Yes, sir. Just had reported that at the public boat basin on Seaway Court, uh-huh. Atlantic Beach, that there's a kid laying in a puddle of blood. Okay, is this Atlantic Beach? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me turn to see Atlantic Beach, okay? Uh-huh, and this is in Jacksonville area. Okay, and what, do you know the address there? Uh, it's the public boat basin off of Seaway Court. Is there an intersection? Uh, Green K. Green K and C? Seaway. And do you know how old the child is? No, I'm headed down there right now. The neighbor just came up and bait banged on my door and told me. And this is a public boat ramp, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll get police and rescue on the way, sir. Okay. Thank you. My name is Tristan Stuart Robertson. I'm a Canadian reporter based in Scotland. For many years, I've been following what happened after these 911 calls and how it spun so far beyond anyone's expectations. They found the body in the ditch and they think it's Josh. I've been involved in the criminal justice system for over 30 years in various capacities and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I was probably their worst enemy, but I wasn't going to give up and I wouldn't have gave up to my last breath. The position here is particularly and all the more concerning. This applicant would not face justice at all. You still got life in you, and you can still see your loved one. And I was like, what do you mean it was an accident? What are you talking about? Did you murder the boy? I see my son at his gravesite. Firemen had to cut the roof from the taxi before they could free them from the wreckage. I beg and cry for Josh to come visit me in my dreams. You know, at the end of the day, my mom, she's just... Show. I could hear his laughter. No, it's just hard. I have to stay strong. But I couldn't see his face. I would never, ever even think of putting another family through what our family's been through. To me, it's like it was yesterday. It's happening now.
Chapter 1 The Boat Ramp Joshua Keith Adrell Hayes Almost every photo of him shows his brown eyes looking out from behind Coke bottle thick lenses. There's the picture of the cornerback standing proudly on the football field in his red high school jersey. Number 27. Another shows him even happier while holding a bass as long as his arm. He caught it on one of countless fishing trips. And there's one of him gripping the antler of a deer he shot. In one photo, he embraces his mom, Patricia, who sits smiling on his knee. In another, he towers over his son, Josh Jr., sometimes called J.J. or J. He was aged three or four then, Josh's hands on his shoulders as they stand in a yard. Josh was wearing his glasses in all those photos. He avoided wearing those thick lenses if he could get away with it. Josh was nearsighted in the left eye and farsighted in the right. His mom described the astigmatism as making his eye more football-shaped. So a couple weeks before he was murdered, Josh took his glasses off for a set of family photos taken at the Walmart in Monument Road, Jacksonville, Florida. It was that final portrait of Josh, without his glasses, that ended up on wanted posters to catch his killer, on the family shirts as they gathered at the murder scene, and on his son, standing next to the coffin. It's become an enduring image of Josh, decades on from his death. But when Josh died, he had his glasses on. He was driven to the parking lot of the Oak Harbor boat ramp in Mayport. It's a neighborhood at the eastern edge of the city of Jacksonville. There are homes nearby, A picnic area with a single table is a few steps from the ramp. The parking lot was without street lights that night. They only got repaired the day after the murder. It was clear and 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 Celsius. The sun and moon had set a couple hours earlier. A single shot was heard from the boat ramp at 10.18 p.m. on Tuesday, August 10th, 1999. Neighbors heard the sound of cars racing away. One was seen with its lights on, the other in darkness. An 18-year-old man who lived a few streets away pulled into the darkened parking spaces of the boat ramp with a female passenger. They spent a few moments in the lot before going to leave. It was the woman who spotted the body, and the man pulled around, saw blood, and kept driving. He went half a dozen homes up the street and spoke to a neighbor, telling him someone was hurt and needed help. The neighbor told his son to call 911. Yeah, there somebody been shot down at the boat dock. And got in the car with the 18-year-old, and they returned to the parking lot. They stopped six to eight feet away. The neighbor touched the victim's hand. It was cold. The pair drove off again to get a neighbor who was an Atlantic Beach police officer and returned to the scene. The officer also called 911. There's a kid laying in a puddle of blood. A Jacksonville Sheriff's Office evidence technician arrived around midnight. They found a shell casing, two cigarette butts, and, quote, blood and brain matter scattered throughout the parking lot. And the power of the gunshot sent Josh's glasses flying more than 20 feet. Police canvassed the area. Most of the neighbors saw nothing. The 18-year-old who found the body knew Josh and described the victim to another 18-year-old at a nearby gas station. Around 1.25 a.m., the second teenager arrived and crossed into the crime scene. He said he, quote, needed to see if the body was Joshua Hayes. 
He said Josh had been missing since 10 p.m. The teenager had been driven to the boat ramp by Josh's brother, Corey. But Corey left without speaking to police. Another detective spoke to Tracy, Josh's partner and the mother of their son. She said they had been together until Josh left with someone named Little Leon sometime between 7 p.m. and 7.30. Tracy said she paged Josh several times. Josh's mom, Patricia, was working overnight at Walmart and got a call at 2.23 a.m. Wednesday morning. I got a phone call from his girlfriend, and she told me I need to come over there, and I told her, I said, because I know what was going on. I said, well, I'm going to have to drop by after work. And she said, no, they found the body in the ditch, and they think it's Josh. And I said, what did you say? And she said, yeah, and nobody's been able to get in touch with him. Corey went home to the trailer park where he lived with Josh. He was in a panic about the body lying at the boat ramp. Mom, I know it's Josh. I know it's Josh, he told her. Patricia drove with him to the police cordon, while younger brother Joseph was imagining, as a worst-case scenario, that Josh was in hospital. The street was blocked off, and Patricia told an officer she needed to get down to the dock because there was a possibility it was her son. She was told to wait. And I went to talk to the officer. I said, but someone said it's possible this would be in my son. And he said, ma'am, he said, due to the injury, we can't make a positive identification. And I said, well, on his left arm, he would have a tattoo that says true. And and his ID would be a Mississippi driver's license. And they said, ma'am, we can't give you that information. Patricia said Josh had a tattoo on his arm, T-R-U, true, standing for love for family and support for each other. The detective told Patricia to step back. They waited. The only lights were ones set up by police. A detective spoke to Patricia at 3.10 a.m., just after the body had been removed. Patricia said Josh was missing, and she had had several phone calls that she needed to go to the boat ramp. She repeated her key identifiers of the license and the tattoo. And then the detectives come out... And he said, you know, we're going to have to run the fingerprints and stuff because of the damage. I asked, I said, well, was, was it a robbery? What happened? And they said, well, if it was a robbery, they didn't get all of his money because he had some money in his sock. And at that point, I kind of knew it was Josh because that's where he did hide his money. But then from where I was standing from the block off, I couldn't see because the only lights down there was the ones that the detectives had put up. It was pitch black down there. And I asked Corey, my other son, I said, did Josh have his Nike ball cap on? And he said, no. I said, well, then that's not Josh because you could see, all you could see was red from the lights. Patricia later said she hadn't realized that the red she was seeing was where they blew her son's head off. Patricia waited at the scene then returned home, then back to the boat ramp when dawn started to break. She kept trying to reach Josh's beeper. But at 8.40 a.m. on August the 11th, Detectives Floyd and Taylor arrived to confirm Joshua Hayes was dead. He was 22 and left behind Josh Jr., who would be 7 in October. They asked Patricia and her husband Robert to go to the morgue for a formal identification. At the morgue, a photo was brought out and laid out flat. Patricia was told, when you're ready to look at it, 
you can flip it over. She turned it over, and there was the face of her firstborn child, framed by the body bag. His nose was broken from hitting the pavement after the violent impact of the bullet. Twelve hours after Josh was shot at the boat ramp, police returned to the scene in daylight to check for any evidence they overlooked. They asked the fire department to wash the blood out of the pavement. It had spread out more than 50 feet from Josh's body. The remains of blood stayed for weeks. Although the casing was found, the bullet was never recovered. It went through Josh's head, a nearby tree, and, Patricia recounted detectives saying, potentially hundreds of yards into the woods beyond the parking lot. Meanwhile, the 18-year-old man who said he was a friend of Josh was formally interviewed by police. He told detectives he had been with Josh for a few hours before Josh left the trailer alone around 9.30 or 10 p.m. After about an hour or an hour and a half, the teenagers said they started to look for Josh because he wasn't returning their pages. He said he didn't ask where Josh was going because Josh was a quiet person and usually kept to himself. He wasn't aware of anyone threatening or trying to harm Josh or Corey. He also said Josh had about $800 on him, in his left pocket or sock. And he knew he had money because rent was due. Corey had told detectives Josh left his girlfriend's home at 9.45 p.m. to go buy some weed at Oak Harbor. He got into a car with a man named Tony, who lived with a man named Philip at Pioneer Point. Corey also said Josh was carrying $600 to $800, most likely in his shoe. He said Josh put about $200 to $250 in his pocket and the rest in his shoe, and he, Tony, and Leon were all aware of how much money Josh had. Detectives met at Lakeside Trailer Park a little before 5 a.m., where the teenager they had interviewed admitted he hadn't given a full statement. He said Josh left with Leon and Tony to buy $250 worth of marijuana. He said Tony lived with Philip, who he had seen take an assault rifle into their apartment earlier. And he said he believed Philip's last name was Harkins. More than six hours had passed since the murder. Josh was wearing a white t-shirt, tan docker pants, and brown sandals. The medical examiner found 113 in cash, along with items including a pager, a pack of gum, a chrome mini scale, and Mississippi and Florida ID. There were no drugs found at the scene. A toxicology exam found a small amount of cocaine had been taken up to six hours before he died the medical examiner concluded that the muzzle of the gun was fired a centimeter or less from Josh's head. There had been a family reunion planned for the upcoming Saturday. Instead, a few days later, the family took Josh home to Mississippi, where he was born and grew up before moving to Florida. The funeral home put a hairpiece on to cover up the back of Josh's head and repaired his broken nose. Patricia said she thought they did a good job, but you could still feel all the staples. The wind picked up and a big black cloud crept overhead as they carried the casket. Patricia was carrying a red shirt of Josh's with the smell of his cologne still on it. Josh was buried next to his grandfather. Late in the evening, after burying Josh, Patricia got a call from detectives. They told her they had made an arrest. As Patricia tells it, 
They had returned home from the funeral on Sunday night, and the next morning she was asleep on her couch and woke to Josh Jr. screaming, That's the man that killed my dad. That's the man that killed my dad. And I jumped up to see what he was talking about. As a TV news report displayed a picture of Philip Harkins marking his first appearance in court. But three days later, the family met with the office of the state attorney for the Fourth Circuit Court of Florida, covering Duval County. Prosecutors said it was a weak case. Philip was released and charges dropped in September. The police investigation didn't end, but it was on a back burner. In November, the assistant state attorney dealing with the case left the prosecutor's office. Two weeks later, the state attorney's office said they had declined to file charges in the murder. Patricia didn't accept their conclusion. She kept pushing for answers, keenly aware that time was running out under laws requiring speedy prosecution. 175 days since Philip's arrest were approaching. A new prosecutor was assigned, Angela Corey. Patricia's husband, Robert, wrote to Florida Governor Jeb Bush, pleading for action on the case. And a couple weeks later, Angela Corey made a deal with a man named Terry Glover. He was at the scene and agreed to testify in court against Philip. He swore that Philip killed Josh. On February 3rd, 2000, Philip Harkins was indicted by a grand jury for murder and attempted robbery with a weapon. He was arraigned the next day and released on his own recognizance. That meant there were no restrictions. He didn't have to post bail money. He just promised to turn up for court whenever he was told. For the next two years, there were dozens of hearings, Philip appeared for some and was excused attendance for many others. Trial dates came and went. And then, just a month before the third anniversary of the murder, yet another trial date was set to go ahead. But Philip didn't turn up to Duval County Court. The judge said he hadn't seen him in some time. He ordered Philip to appear four days later. He didn't. And a warrant was issued on the 12th of July, 2002. Philip was gone. A couple years after the murder, Detective Davis had Josh's glasses returned to Patricia. He told her they were still potentially evidence. She has never been able to open that brown paper bag. A Murder Without End is reported and edited by Tristan Stewart Robertson. It is produced by Liam Pollock. Music by Dylan Anthony. Artwork by Jason Skinner. Sources for this episode include interviews, depositions, and police reports. This series is dedicated to the memory of Lyra McKee. Journalism like this might be free to listen to, but it isn't free to make. A Murder Without End was created without any funding. All research, archive audio, voiceovers, and music were sourced and paid for by myself. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with your friends, leave a review, and visit our website, tomorrow.is, to donate what you can. 
any support you can spare would be invaluable. Thank you for listening.